want to give you the Reader's Digest condensed version of, of this message because uh, it's been a lot of fun to study this text and, and to prepare this message. And I have one more note before I get into that. I want to remind you next Sunday we will take an offering, a love offering for a small church pastor. Now I'm drawing a blank. Travis, do you remember who it is? It changed on me. I know we had and then it got changed. Daryl Riffle from uh, Larned and his wife is Cheryl. And uh, Daryl got called to the ministry late in life. I think he was late 40s, maybe 50 before he felt the call to preach. So he's, uh, he, he's been around a while, but he's just getting started. I think, I think he's in his second year, perhaps. So anyway, we will take that love offering for them and uh, get that to them. And I pray God will bless you. Listen to this, Luke chapter 1, turn to, that, turn to that in your Bible if you'd like to, Luke chapter 1, it's part of the, the Christmas story, and, uh, and this just excites me to no end. I was reading this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I came across a new thought, and I said, I want to preach that, this will be fun. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. What a blessing, huh? And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. Now, it's that phrase, you shall call him Jesus, that first arrested my attention and said, just wait just one moment right there. There's something pretty incredible happening right here. To start with, this angel, Gabriel, came to Mary with this greeting, and the Bible specified he was sent from God. Now that's important to know just to say that this wasn't the angel's idea. It wasn't a man's idea. It wasn't some kooky preacher's idea. This is God's will. This was his plan. Every bit as much as when we read in the Bible that God said, let us make man in our image. This is still part of God's redemption plan, and, and he's had this in mind all along. This is nothing new, no surprise. This is God's plan for us, that we would learn to love the Lord God. I was fascinated to hear about an 11-year-old Kent suddenly in his heart wanting to turn to God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that awesome? And, and our, our goal in life, our purpose, is that we should love God. That's what the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, hear this, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus reemphasized that for us when they came to him and said, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. The problem is, because of sin entering people's hearts, it became just about impossible to love God. You could fear Him, you could respect His power, but there's always sin keeping you from loving Him with your entire being like God wants us to love Him. So, He's got a plan. Just like He said, let us make men in our image, He said, let's have a virgin give birth to a Messiah. Isn't that crazy? For the past number of months, four months, I guess, we've been talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in, and in all of their cases, with the exception of Leah, God had their husbands pray for them so they could conceive to have a baby. And in this case, God says, I'm going to ramp it up a notch. I'm going to have a virgin have a baby. She won't even have a husband yet other than their betrothal, but they hadn't come together as a married couple. Isn't that just pretty incredible that God would say, it's one thing for somebody who's barren to have a baby, I'm going to show my power and say, a virgin. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And Isaiah said, and you shall call him Emmanuel. 
Isn't that just an incredible thought? That's, that's, more, than, that's more than even a, 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 a wild thinking pastor would come up with. Somebody would say something like, let's have the kids have a contest with their Legos and build a nativity set. <laughs> if you were there, that went over like a lead balloon. But this is really crazy. I know what let's do. Let's have a virgin have a baby. Oh, my goodness. And he said, greetings, favored one. Would you like to be a favored one? I mean, think about that. If God was to say, oh, I, I love all my children, and an angel says, I know you love them all, but who's your favorite? Who do you really favor? I don't know about you. I, I don't feel like I deserve to be a favored one, but I would like some favors from God. <laughs> I'd like to be favored, loved. Listen to this, Isaiah chapter 58. The Bible is, is telling us this story about, about Judah going astray and, and being backslidden. And, and yet they were still religious. And they would hold fasts and they would fast ceremonially and, and they would uh, you know, look terrible and try to make themselves look like they were really struggling for the Lord. And they said, you know, we've, we've humbled all ourselves and yet God doesn't notice this. But the prophet said, look, you're, you're holding a fast for your own pleasure. You're just trying to look good, but you're really rotten inside. You only fast so you can fight and hit people with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice heard from God on high. So here's the kind of fast God was looking for. He said, I choose uh, a fast where you would loose the bonds of the oppressed where you would undo the straps of the yoke and let the oppressed go free. Is it not uh, the fast that I declare that I'm looking for, the kind of fast where you would share your bread with the hungry and your, your homes with the homeless? And if you do that kind of a fast, he said, your light will shine around the world and, and it'll bring healing to the people. That's the kind of righteousness and fast I'm looking for. Then you'll call out to the Lord and he'll say, I'm here. I'm present. I'm with you. And the Lord will guide you continually, and He'll satisfy the desires of your heart. His presence will always be here. And then there's this interesting phrase. <laughs> he said, you will be called, if you will do those, these kind of things and really minister to people, He said, you will be called a repairer of breaches. Not britches, but they get holes in them too. You will be a repairer of breaches, broken down places, broken down walls, broken down homes, broken down families, broken down people. And you're a repairer. Doesn't sound like a fancy title, does it? But you're the kind of person God says, I can use you to fix these broken down parts of society and communities and people. And you'll be the restorer of streets to dwell in. I was out hunting with my son-in-law the other day and we came to a road he wanted to go down to check out a particular place he had seen on Google Earth or something and there was a sign that said minimum uh, maintenance on road drive at your own risk <laughs> isn't that crazy who wants to go down roads where they warn you straight up I've been on bad roads that they didn't warn you but they warn you straight up there's a terrible road enter at your own risk and you see people living on that kind of street figuratively speaking and God says I want you to be the kind of people who repairs these kind of streets to make it easy for people to come and go and to get around and you'll be a restorer of their avenues their ways their paths and the Lord so you you'll be favored you'll be favored that's what we're getting at here and then he said favored one and then he says the Lord is with you now it's awesome to be favored and and it kind of goes hand in hand doesn't it that if you're favored that God is with you do you know today for sure that God is with you that his presence is not only around you but in you that's what happens when you become a born again child of God just like Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit we get born spiritually we're all born physically we're here obviously right but you can be born again, that is born in your spirit. So now that you have the spirit of God. 
All this the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 1, says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. The virgin will conceive. Somebody asked the question, well, so what about the virgin birth? You know, maybe that just meant a teenager or a young girl. Well, what if we just do away with that argument in the church? And what if we just do away with the virgin birth? What difference will it make? Well, here's the difference it'll make. You no longer have Jesus, the Son of God. You lose Jesus, the Son of God, and you just will throw out all the rest that happened in his life because he's no longer the Son of God. It's very important that we believe this and know this, we understand it, and even if we can't figure it out how that could possibly happen, we still believe God did it. That's what the Bible tells us. <clears throat> and then His presence is so, so, so important to us. Here's what the Bible says about that in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Think about this. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray. How awesome is this? That we live in the presence of God and He's near us when we pray. I, I appreciate everything President Trump is doing to try to make America great again. But if we really want to be great, there's this one thing we really have to do. I got a letter from President Trump the other day. Well, okay, so technically it wasn't a letter, it was an email. And probably 482,627 other people also got it. But I got it, okay? And they asked my opinion, what does President Trump need to focus on to make America great again? Since they asked, I thought I'd be honest. I said, here's the deal. Oh, I didn't say it that way. I said, dear Mr. Trump. I think I said, dear Mr. President Trump or something of that nature. I said, if you really want to make America great again, continue the track you're on, but be sure, be sure that we have God in America again. And all of our policies and everything we're doing, that will make America great again. And specifically, I said, we need to be sure that we're a blessing to Israel because the Bible promises, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And so we need to be sure our foreign policy is bless Israel. Israel, and that will make America great again. If we're going to do that, if we're going to bless God and bless His people, we have to obey and observe the Word of God. So here's my litmus test for Congress. If they want to pass laws and all kinds of statements and take action on things, here's the litmus test that Congress needs to have. Does this law or action we're about to take square up with the Word of God? If it does, clearly seen in the Word of God in the Bible showing this is what we should do, fine, pass it 100%. If it doesn't square up with the Word of God, kick it out immediately and quit wasting time. How else will we have God with us in America and make America great again if we aren't living by and to and according to His Word. From my house to your house to the White House to the House of Representatives. We need God in America again. Listen to this. This comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 15. <clears throat> the Spirit of God came on Azariah, and he went out to meet King Ahaz. And this is what he said. Listen to me, Asa. And all of Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him. All right? The Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. We need God in America by having his word in America, the spirit of Christ in America, Jesus in our hearts and living amongst us. And so you'll have a son and you'll name him Jesus. Now here's the fun part of the message. This is the part that blessed me the most. Jesus. You're going to call him Jesus. Now, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you've looked up names enough to recognize this or not, but you probably know Jesus is not a Hebrew name. Have you figured that out? Jesus is a Greek name. Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Yeshua, or in, as we would probably say it, Joshua. 
And the name means Savior. Savior. You're going to have a baby boy, and he's going to be the Savior. In fact, you're going to name him Savior. When I was a kid, I had a friend named uh, Painter. His last name was Painter. And I, it never occurred to me in life until I met this young kid in grade school. I said, his name is Painter. Isn't that funny? I know people who are painters. Somebody, maybe in his family, long, long, long time ago, painted. And so they call that person Painter. I knew another kid. His last name was Carpenter. And I began to figure things out, and I thought, isn't that something? That kid's name is Carpenter. Wouldn't that be fun if he grew up to be a carpenter? And somebody would say, I need to get my, my house fixed, or I need an addition. Who shall I call? Oh, call Carpenter. In, my, in one of my churches, I had a family in Sylvia. Their last name was Green. Every one of them had red hair. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. I'd see them, and I'd say, Green. Red Green was probably their great-grandfather. <laughs> Red, green. Wouldn't it be something if, if, their, if their occupation they chose in life was to help this planet become green? And they could paint, paint everything red. That would make sense. Red-headed family named green. But here's the deal. Wouldn't it be amazing if you're going to have a son and he's supposed to be the savior of the world and you name him savior? That's what the name means. Savior. Interestingly enough, when the uh, scribes and the Pharisees came to Jesus to ask him questions, now I, I got to qualify this. I don't know this for an absolute fact yet, but I've been trying to back check it. I've been trying to figure it out, make sure it's true, but I believe it's true. You look it up and you tell me if you find a reference that's different. I never found anywhere in the New Testament where they came to him and said, Jesus, we have a question. Jesus, tell us this. Jesus, we want to know. They never called him by his name. They said, teacher, but they never learned from his teaching. You know why they never called him Jesus? Because it means Savior. And they weren't about to admit that he's the Savior because they were in the process of rejecting him as their Savior. So they never said Jesus. But the lost and the broken, guess what they called out? Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus means Savior. And he was born into this world to be our Savior. And so he went about doing good, teaching and healing and even forgiving because his name gave proof to who he was and what he was to do, save us from our sins. Therefore, he died for us as our Savior. I just want to ask you this morning, have you called on the name Jesus as your Savior? Have you called out in any way, shape, or form, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, I'm lonely, I'm lost. Jesus, I'm confused. Jesus, I don't know what to say. Jesus, help me. Jesus, forgive me. I love Christmas. Man, I love Christmas more than anything. Except maybe Resurrection Sunday. That's just an awesome day, too. I wish we'd decorate for Resurrection Sunday the same as we do Christmas. That'd be pretty fun. But this morning, as we get thoroughly immersed in this Christmas season, I want to be sure you've called on the name of our Savior, Jesus. Would you bow your heads and, and pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for sending your Son into this world. Thank you for sending our Savior. I remember the day that I first called on you with sincerity to be saved. I'm so glad Kent called on you to be saved. Father, if, if young boys can call on you, I'm sure older boys can. I'm sure grown men can. If you would listen to the prayer of a child, I'm, I'm sure you'd hear the prayer of an adult. Jesus, speak to hearts today. and Help them make up their mind right now before they leave their seat this morning that they're going to call on the name Jesus right now and say, Father, I'm sorry, I've sinned. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. 
thank you for raising from the dead. So I have a living Savior, a living Jesus, who's preparing a place for us, Lord, even as we speak. And you could come, Lord Jesus, at any moment, I'm aware of that, to receive your church home, to bring us home to be with you. God, I wouldn't want anybody here to miss that moment. I want everybody here to be ready. So we pause to call on the name of Jesus. When the people ask your disciples, how can I be saved? They said, call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved. So we're not talking, Lord, about a foreign God or a certain belief or uh, a mystical thing. We're not talking about a superstition or anything else other than the Son of God, born of a virgin, called by the angel, Jesus, Savior. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for filling us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for keeping us on your straight and narrow path. Thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for being our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name.